Good morning from Boston. It's a beautiful spring morning here. Hope you're having a great weather in your neck of the woods. Welcome to the 17th edition of USCIC's Biopharma and Healthcare Summit. We have an exciting lineup of colleagues. Today, each panel has been well-crafted with a mix of early stage biopharma companies, the large biopharma, investors, and the regulatory side. Please take advantage of excellent, talented colleagues who have joined us from all over the world to be with us virtually. USAIC is a group of smart, passionate folks with a heart. As I've said in the past, when good people come together, good things happen. And today is no exception. For the benefit of medical students and young researchers, we have kept the summit registration free for the fourth year. Students and young researchers and industry colleagues are our future leaders, and we are happy and proud to support them. Since the last summit, we focused on taking clinical trials in India forward. We launched an initiative with the help of Dr. Andrew Plum and several of R&D heads. We collected some data and partnered with PwC to bring out a white paper. Few startling figures which came and I found personally very disturbing were India with one sixth of the world population with 1.44 billion people. India's share in the global clinical trials is less than 3.2%. This is absolutely ethically, scientifically, and morally wrong. We need to correct this. The good thing is the sponsors, our industry colleagues, the CROs are very keen to increase their footprint in India. I'm hopeful and optimistic that there is a good possibility that these trials can go up by 5x in the next coming years. Sujay, our colleague from PwC, would be presenting his findings from the white paper on clinical trial opportunities in India. I would not like to go into it, but PwC has taken a deep dive into the clinical landscape trials in India and hope you'll find his presentation and the white paper interesting. With India taking presidency of G20 this year, it's a great opportunity to elevate the level of discussion for the R&D and the global supply chain in the G20 forum. We are honored and privileged to have the G20 Sherpa from India Amitabh Khan, who has been a great supporter of USAIC for over 14 years, help us out in a panel discussion. And I'm hopeful with his help, R&D and the global supply chain agenda would become the focus of the healthcare initiative at the G20 meeting, which is going to happen with the leadership of world leaders in September in India this year. USAIC is committed to gender equity. We are slowly but definitely making progress. A lot can be done, and we will continue to put in our efforts towards gender equity. Thanks to our sponsors, without whom this meeting would not have been possible. In terms of their names, let me go alphabetically, if I may. Amgen, Bharat Bartek, Dr. Ella didn't want it, his name to be announced to keep it anonymous. Biocom, Biogen, Johnson & Johnson, Jubilant, Merck, Pfizer, and Takeda. Thank you so much. Today is going to be a great learning and fun day. Grab your tea, coffee, lunch, drink, or a dinner and watch our chair and EMC, the one and only one, Dr. Andrew Plum, 
run today's summit. Over to Andy. Karun, thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do to bring this conference to so many people around the globe. As I'm listening to your opening comments, I reflect firstly what a privilege it is to be part of this summit for many years and to have the incredible honor to MC for the past eight. It's terrific. And every year I make this comment, this is the best agenda ever. It's an incredible lineup of esteemed individuals. And I hope that many of our viewers are able to stay for most of the day. And the second reflection as you're making your comments is I think about how unbelievably massive our world is when we think about the global challenges we face. And I also think about how small our world is, that I have the chance for my office attic to address thousands of um, young and old around the world. So with that said, just a few introductory comments. And if we can please go to the next slide. And for those of you who saw my talk last year, it was, it was wizardry last year because I did my talk without any slides. That We had some technical issues. So I'm hoping that doesn't happen this year. But I left on a, on a positive note, and that was regarding the, the incredible acceleration of innovation that we've been seeing in this century. If we just look at a timeline, we can take events such as an event that occurred in, towards the end of the um, 19th century, and that was the first serendipitous identification by Johann Meister of DNA working with leukocytes and culture. It wasn't until 50 years later that a very famous trio of Watson, Crick, and of course, Rosalind Franklin identified the structure of DNA, the famous double helix. It wasn't then until another 50 years, half of a century, until we actually had that full genome sequenced. And that was really at the turn of the 21st century. And what happened after that 150 page nature journal that very few of us read end to end, what happened the next day? Absolutely nothing. People woke up and they thought, well, what just happened? We made this huge investment. We know every, see, every piece of DNA in the human genome. We know much of the variability that exists in the human genome, but what's happened? Nothing. Well, it takes time to unravel a mystery as grand as our genome. And that's happened in troves over the last 20 years. The progress that we've seen over the last 20 years, and I'll, I'll posit predominantly driven by advances in human genetics have been just remarkable. Now, of course, it's human, not human genetics alone. It's our understanding of mechanistic biology, the work that's done by graduate students and postdocs and principal investigators in academic laboratories. And it's this explosion of therapeutic modalities, that trio, human genetics, mechanistic biology, and modality diversification that allowed us to make just incredible headway in healthcare over the past years. And you see some examples of in cell therapy and gene therapy, even in vaccines. We've had a vaccine that was just approved in Dengue that I'll comment to in a second that offers to change the course of human disease, not just in wealthy countries, but across the globe. If we go to the next slide, please. The ecosystem that we live in is incredibly complex, but it works. And there are three drivers to innovation. There's the Academic Research Center, there's the biotechnology and investment community, and of course, there's the community that I live in, and that's the biopharmaceutical community. And it's this interplay between these three organizations, driven by mission to deliver healthcare to patients in need, and by a business model. There needs to be a business model, a for-profit business model that drives this innovation. And for us to maintain that business model, we have to ensure that we maintain our reputation. And that's been something that we've been challenged with over the years. In order for us to work together in this triad, we require partnerships. And I've listed some of the great partnerships that have been stood up over the years, the Innovative Health Initiative in the EU, Accelerating Medicines for Patients in the NIH, EU Medicines for All, um, Dengue Zero across countries, multi-regional clinical trials. All of these are necessary for us to come together to, to overcome the complexity of biology and deliver medicines to patients. If we go to the next slide, please, let me just double click on comments that Karun has made. We call this meeting N of one to N of a billion. N of one is the kind of innovation that we can, we can do today. We can make individual therapies for single patients, but we have billions of patients in need who require those therapies. There's no country no region, no democracy in the world as, that calls that to the forefront as much as India. We look at examples of respiratory disease where 20% of the world burden of respiratory disease is in India, yet only 3% of trials that are studying medicines for respiratory diseases 
are taking place in India. There is a gap, and that is our responsibility to fill that gap. If we go to the next slide, please. But we're seeing progress, and we're going to talk about some of that progress today. And actually, a lot of the barrier that exists now is not real, it's perception, it's myth. We've seen great regulatory reforms. We've seen, and we'll talk about this in one of the panels, we've seen a growth of top-notch investigators in tier one and tier two cities. It, the Indian government has stepped up immensely, collaborations and policy reforms. And there's an opportunity with all of the unrest in Eastern Europe, which was a hotbed for clinical trials for the industry to make up for a, a lot of that loss in India. So if we go to the next slide, please, and this will be my last slide, and then we'll get the day started. We have an obligation. We have an incredible privilege to do what we do. We're in life science. We get to unravel the mysteries of life, and we get to turn that knowledge into medicines for patients. That is a privilege. We also have an opportunity, and that's an opportunity to deliver those medicines to patients across the world.